Good morning. Good to be with you today as we continue in our study of John's Gospel. Uh, today we're going to pick up in the 13th chapter, and that chapter, well, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, represent the farewell discourse that Jesus shares uh, with his disciples and other believers. And this is a major shift in John's gospel. Uh, one of the uh, critical points of John's gospel is Jesus' washing of his disciples' feet, which is recorded in no other uh, gospel. But John made a point of, of emphasizing this to illustrate the servanthood of Jesus. And now, as we pick up in the 13th chapter, we find Jesus deep in the Passover celebration and having a Passover meal with his disciples. And we pick up in the 21st verse, and it says, After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. And he was troubled because of what he was going to, to go through. He was troubled because of, of Judas. Uh, he was troubled uh, by the circumstances that he found himself in. And the word that he uses there is interesting. Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. And this is telling because these were people that had been with Jesus for three years. They were his closest friends, his closest allies. Yet, they didn't know they were capable of deserting Jesus, just as Judas was. So they were troubled as well. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that would be John, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple. He motioned to John and said, ask him which one it means. Uh, it could be any of us that were going to betray Jesus. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is the one whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. And this was a sign of friendship to dip your bread in, in a dish and hand it to someone was a sign of friendship. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Jesus Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Jesus took the bread, Satan entered him. So even though Judas had been one who had deceived, had stolen from uh, Jesus and the disciples, here we see that Satan entered him in, in power. And Jesus said, what you're about to do, do quickly. And then in the 30th verse, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Uh, he went into the night, into evil. He left Jesus and light and eternity to betray him. And then in the 31st verse, we see the beginning of the story where Jesus predicts uh, uh, Peter's denial. When he was gone, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. So we see this term used five times in these uh, two verses, verses 31 and 32, this glorification being his hour, the time that has come for his, his suffering and his crucifixion. 
In verse 33, he says, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. This term is a very affectionate term. It is a parental type of term. It is a term that, that we only find here in John's Gospel. It is a very tender term that Jesus uses for his disciple, and he is now just hours away from his crucifixion. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. And then in verse 34, John records Jesus' words, a new covenant I give you, love one another. Now this is interesting because, in fact, it's not a new command. Uh, Jesus has set a standard here. But this command to love in one another, in fact, goes back to the Old Testament, back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Well, what makes this new? What makes this different? Well, Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So this is an identifier, if you will, a sign to identify Jesus' disciples, Jesus' followers, and to identify the church. If you love one another, that is the way that we are known by our love for one another. And this is, is a constant throughout the Bible, throughout Scripture, that Jesus, God, is love. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Peter, as we know, is always out front. He wants to, to know what's going on. He wants to lead the pack. And Jesus replied, Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And as many times as I've read that, I've completely skipped the word now. Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but will follow later. Well, why not? Well, because Jesus is going to the cross. He is going to be crucified. He is going to be buried. He is going to be resurrected, and he is going to ascend into heaven. And the disciples could not go there now, but later, of course, they would die, and they would be resurrected. They would follow Jesus into heaven. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'm going to lay my life down for you. Well... You know, aren't we the same today? We don't want to get too hard on Peter because we're the same way. When we're in church with fellow believers and the music is playing and we're involved and, and the message just touches our heart and we say, oh, I'm going to go into missions or I'm going to do something. I'll be in the ministry. But when the swords are drawn and... We come face to face with our commitment. We say, eh, well, maybe not. I did not know him. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay my life down for you. And Jesus looked at him, said, will you really lay down your life for me? And I'll tell you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Well, we know, looking back, what happened, but Peter and the disciples, they didn't know. They were concerned. What's, you know, what's going on here? We've had uh, Jesus wash our feet. We've seen Judas disown and us and, and leave. Uh, we've, we've seen Peter uh, being told he's going to deny Jesus. 
what's going on? Their, their hearts were troubled. They were anxious. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me, Jesus says. In verse 2 of the 14th chapter, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Uh, interesting here, the King James Version translates that into mansions. And I think that is very misleading. In that culture at that time, when a couple was to be married, the man would, would build a room uh, onto his father's house, and this is where they would live permanently. And I think that that more closely uh, associates or more closely identifies what is being prepared for us, that, that we will have a room, a place to reside that is close to Jesus. But I think to, to believe that we will have this immense uh, mansion with jewels and all of that is to center our attention on the wrong thing. I think that we will have a place to be reside, to reside, but, but the important part of that is that we will be close to Jesus. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I'm doing this for you. My death, my crucifixion, my agony is for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Well, we think today in our, in our time, we had a Chinese spy balloon uh, shot out of the sky. We have riots in our streets and murders and police cars and buildings burned and our country being tribalized. And we, we wonder, is Jesus coming back? Do we have hope? Can we... Can we believe what is found here in Scripture? Thomas, doubting Thomas, said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Well, they should have known because they had been with Jesus for three years. Uh, they should have known that he is the Messiah. And Jesus answered in in probably the most well-known verse of Scripture, uh, Jesus answered, I am, and this is the sixth of the seven I am statements in John's Gospel, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Thomas Kempis, in his book written about 1430, he was a German-Dutch canon, uh, in his, his comments on, on this uh, section of Scripture, one of my favorites, he says, Follow thou me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And these are the comments that he makes about this verse of Scripture. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. I am the way which thou must follow, the truth which thou must believe, the life for which you must hope. I am the inviolable way the infallible truth, the never-ending life. Can we believe what Scripture says? Absolutely we can. If there was another way, uh, Jesus was not have died on the cross. There would have been some other course, but Jesus 
died for our sins. He was given to us by the Father so that we might have eternal life with him in the room prepared for us in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this lesson today. Thank you for scripture that reveals to us the truth. Uh, thank you, Father, for this particular time of year, this Easter season where we celebrate and remember and recognize the death of Jesus and his resurrection. Father, we pray for those that are ill and pray for their healing, uh, for those traveling, that we pray for their safety. We pray for our church and its preparation for Easter. We pray for its leadership. Uh, Father, we most often and not enough thank you for Jesus. Uh, Father, be with us as we go out and share the good news that Jesus is Lord. It is in his mighty name that we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. God bless you.